Hi everyone, welcome to another book review. Today I'll be reviewing Louis Gerstner's Who Says Elephants Can't Dance? Inside IBM's Historic Turnaround. Now this book was set um, from the early 90s, so from 1993 to 2002, which was Louis' entire reign as IBM CEO which was at the time at least the longest um, outsider so to speak had been CEO since the Watson founders so Watson senior founded IBM and then later his son uh, can't remember his name but Watson junior uh, also headed the company so the context behind the book is it's the again as I said early 90s IBM has at the time been having couple of years of turbulence from a financial uh, point of view and really uh, at the start of his term it looked like IBM if they had continued in the trajectory that they had had for the last five or six years they would run out of cash in about two years right so can you imagine this huge company like IBM just evaporating from the world of business just like that and it's happened before right from the likes of Kodak and all other and 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 a, and a few other companies that once looked invincible but then just disappear through you know a bad couple of years bad strategy but usually bad execution right so really really tough job and what made it even tougher was the fact that Louis was not a technologist, so to speak, you know, um, and IBM was a leader in the technology space and a really big brand. So how does one come in from the outside and effect change in this really tough industry at a time when Apple is firing on all cylinders? Steve Jobs has just come back for his second uh, stint at the company. Microsoft is uh, the world's um, most valuable company at the time, or at least IT company. So Bill Gates is, I think it, it was when he first became the richest person uh, in the entire world. So that's the context. Oracle, Oracle under Larry Ellison is also firing at the time. You know, they are really also becoming a leader and a behemoth in business. So. IBM at that time is facing really, really tough challenges and challenges that were going to prove fatal if nothing was done or if nothing was done in time, at least. And the main problem was really a weak balance sheet, right? So um, they bet they had this product, uh, which was the mainframes. The IBM is obviously an innovator and a pioneer in that space. So they had... That, that was the darling of the company, paid everyone salaries, um, you know, this company, is, this product or, or product set keeps doing well, really didn't matter what IBM did, they could, you know, that's how much revenue the mainframes were responsible for. And I think at the time it was about 80% of all IBM revenue, can you imagine, right, being on the mainframes. Now, now the PC explosion is happening at the time, I just mentioned Apple. Uh, Microsoft so all of these companies and so those two companies in particular are obviously pushing that messaging that PCs are the new wave no one's going to need mainframes anymore this is where it's at right so this is why IBM kind of found itself uh, in a position where it had lost faith in the public and everyone is kind of betting on all these new technologies there's a lot of rah-rah in the market about where uh, the future of technology is going and IBM is seemingly uh, kind of the old uh, regime and now all of these new companies are saying hey come with us if you want to stay on top of what's new in the technology space right so very 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 tough uh, tough environment and tough climate to be coming into any company especially you know as CEO because your head will be uh, on the block it's either you're going to be the hero that turns around IBM or you're going to be the guy that kind of uh, was at the helm when the Titanic sunk. So I, I'm, I was very excited, I guess, by that, by that introduction, because I mean, 
it only takes amazing leaders to to pull something like that off you can't you, there's no accident you don't accidentally uh, turn that ship around you have to know exactly what you're doing and i think by all intents and purposes from what i've read this guy really knew what he was doing it was very uh deliberate in his actions and he was ruthless he really just went straight for what he wanted to do and he discarded of everything that didn't fit his plan so i'm going to talk about some of the things that i took out of the book and perhaps some of the themes that um uh, were, were, were were really consistent and were highlighted throughout the book so that if you are interested in any of these i can then recommend this book based upon that right so I mean, it's not a unique situation, as I've said. There are so many companies, again, that have successfully turned turned around or that have sunk, right? And so, so what I want to highlight is kind of the main issues or kind of the main things that, according to Louis, again, you look at when you are coming in as a CEO at that particular point in time. And I think maybe some of the younger um you know viewers like myself will really come to appreciate um from what i'm about to say so i said to you that you know revenues were in decline and the company was running out of cash so now the question was become okay it's very clear that the market is moving this way it's very clear that we can't keep betting you know on this product to get us out of jail we need to find a way to make more money to increase you know the top line but as well to ensure that our business as a whole is cash flow healthy which is one thing i also learned from this book that uh, you know there are ways to artificially engineer uh, a healthy looking top line so that obviously it can give off the illusion of growth right but um in in some instances it's just a matter of clever accounting right oaks know how to you know just play the books and play certain deals so that they look like from a year on year perspective uh the company is growing but it's not because if it's not profitable one but if it's not also cash flow healthy then it poses a really big risk because I mean, especially in the time that we in now, look at with the COVID nineteen, companies with healthy balance sheets are the ones who are going to be able to survive and weather the storm, right? If you don't have a good balance sheet, you really don't have that much rope to play with. You can't, you can't even stomach, you know, let's say a ten percent, twenty percent de decline in uh, revenues. You can't, you know, because. You don't have money to pay your 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 staff and especially because if everyone else is struggling they're probably going to want to delay as well the time in which they pay you so it's only the ones who have a healthy balance sheet healthy cash reserve that will be able to you know play uh with the situation and weather that storm right so i digress i digress so you in that you in that situation right so now the question becomes okay how do you stop the bleeding the 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 uh, present danger how do you stop the bleeding in the ship or, or close the hole in the ship and while at the same time build an arc right to get to migrate from the ship to 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 this new future right the arc will get you to weather that storm and get you to to new to to greener pastures hopefully so that that's really what he was facing and i think one of the biggest things that he said is at that point in time you need to lean out you need to lean out your strategy you can't have 10 10 different uh focuses you have to you know be able to narrow it down to three or four items and build the company around that which is really i think the crux of the book it everything speaks about the mechanics of ensuring that okay so i have the strategy right whether it's we're gonna acquire company x or we're gonna build product y right but it talks about what are the mechanics that a ceo that a leader needs to look at in order to ensure that the company is built such that it can accommodate that strategy such that it can execute against that strategy right and we call that culture right for the most part right the the kind of gray and um the, the gray and an all-encompassing term would be called culture right how does everyone interact with 
each other how does the company move as a collective that's culture but now it makes it trickier because again you're coming into an ibm we were the leaders we are the darling of the stock market and we are tech giants right i mean we were the company where people come in and they are promised a job for life you don't have to worry about anything else you with us you know you with the leaders in the market normal rules don't apply to us kind of like that hubris if you have uh, read Shakespeare you know that that over uh, uh, that, that overbearing pride that uh, sometimes leads to the demise of the hero in this case of the company right there too much pride we are IBM I mean nothing's gonna happen to us until it does so in that situation how do you change the mentalities of people to go back to hunger mode into a mode of being hunters into a mode of really uh, fighting against uh, the competition and listening to customers more attentively, almost having that beginner's mindset once again, right? And uh, so that, that was, I think, the biggest uh, stumbling block that he found to say the company is not, once again, set up anymore to respond to customer queries uh, in time. It's not uh, set up anymore to put the customer at its center, right? It's all about politics uh, internally and all these little fiefdoms, right? And so what do I do? How do I change it? And so he it speaks about the types of decisions that he had to make to ensure that the company was 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 singing as one one is all about uh, one is process right uh, and i think uh for 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 any of you that are working for big companies you'll know that processes are, are a big part of how you do business how you work on a day-to-day -day. and most most of the time it's because when you're accountable to the stock market and to shareholders you can't just have a gray and an opaque system in which you operate you need to have a formal way of doing things so and that's why we have processes however processes tend to have this way of derailing the main or rather maybe the initial uh, point of why they were put in place over time, over a couple of decades, they sometimes get murky. You often hear people in big companies say, well, no, this is how we've always done it, you know, so we kind of lose sight of why certain things were put in place. And at IBM at the time, it seems like there was that was no exception. They were in a situation where there's too many processes that don't make sense. Uh, there's too many uh, fiefdoms, I think is the right way to say it, because they, they, they were horizontally, they weren't integrated, right? They had they had basically different divisions and different regions operating in their own way right because all of these executives kind of have this pride and have this i run my shop this is how i run my shop you know because i am measured on how well this region is doing so let me do my thing and here comes this guy and he's saying no we are in trouble here we need to all work together we need to change the way we work this way wasn't working so i have to change our processes i have to ensure that we have a global view of the client for example in order for us to prove our customer uh, centricity and also to just deliver on our increased uh, customer satisfaction because that's what he wanted to do to to gain back the markets trust in that sense so processes were a big thing uh, that he had to work on I had to work on standardizing and ensuring that there's a constant way of work whether you in working for ibm uk working for ibm in america or in the middle east it had to all be standardized and to do that he had to fire some people because there were some people who didn't want that there were turf wars and all of those things and as a ceo as a strong ceo as well those are the some of things some of the things that he had to do deal with and some of the people that he had to fire top performing people as well um so and and, and i think that shows a really 
big strength in character and that's something that I really admire in any business leader. I hate business leaders who are textbook but yet don't have you know some of the softer qualities like courage, like integrity and just like uh, you know that that intense in, intense uh, consistency in execution. Some people tend to you know bend when it's a top performer or this or that but you can't build a sustainable culture uh, when you have all of these exceptions in place okay so that was a big thing and then what else what else what else what else uh yeah people people uh and the biggest thing about changing people is changing how you reward them right who wins who is the who is exalted and, and said to be an example in the business right and how do they get there you have to ask yourself those questions for example he says here that he he can't be uh, giving speeches about integration and teamwork when your bonuses and uh, a huge part of re your remuneration especially even from a, a senior managerial level perspective is based on how your little team or unit is doing so you have to first change the com um, remuneration structure and say no you're going to be rewarded by how the whole team does that way it gives you an incentive to collaborate right so so that those were the type of hacks that it gives in the book to say you can't shy away from from doing those things from changing the remuneration structure immediately from changing the, the bonuses and all of that because he says you know people do what you inspect not what you expect so you can't give a speech and expect people to change the way they operate no change what you inspect what do you look at if you stop looking at individual divisional numbers and start looking at collective numbers and spreading the profit uh, based on that you will never get that desired change in action okay so people and then organize it that's uh tied to organizational structure as well so you can't still be setting up your business in a way that's very siloed that's very divisional and that's very non-complementary and expect teamwork so again this you can chop up and apply um however your strategy or however your intended outcome uh, would be right so if you wanted to segment the business you can't then you know have it overlapping too much you would have to uh, structure it in a manner that is consistent with what you wish to for the outcome to be right? so remember people do what you inspect not what you expect so that's another point and then operationalizing culture which is 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 i think the almost the conclusion to everything i've just said to kind of say culture is not this uh you know esoteric and this strange concept that we talk about in conferences and that is in every single uh boardroom you know the all those values that people, every company has in their boardroom culture he talks about that culture is operational you know culture is what is done on a day to day you have to find a way to bring in those values or whatever or the vision if you call if your company tends to call it that you have to operationalize it how does it look on a day-to-day -day? don't just say uh we are all about integrity here no find a way to ensure that that is root embedded in the day-to-day -day how someone does their job whether it's you know uh you have i don't know you have someone checking checking certain you know work before it goes out i don't know and and based on i don't know how you would you know kind of um mark against something like integrity but it speaks about that's that's what you need to figure out as a leader if you aim for it to be successful and i think that's true because one of the things that's very uh, frustrating about uh, corporations is that what what's being said on the the, the, the company websites and the um, integrated reports and all these things never really translates to what's being done on a day-to-day, -day. never really translates to how people feel on a day-to-day. -day. And that tends to have an adverse effect because it then 
often looks like the senior leadership or the or the or the management or whatever are actually dishonest people because when people say no don't that's not how we feel on on the ground we don't feel that on the ground it very it looks very disingenuous at the end so it's actually to your to your to to your benefit to ensure that whatever you say is and can have an operational um, an operational application to it. Otherwise, don't say it at all, you know, because people will end up resenting what you say because they never feel it anyway. So why should we listen to you? Um, so those are some of the huge um, um, points that I took out of this book. And it's really in many ways... Uh, um, inspirational for me and uh, i really enjoyed reading it man I, I think i'd recommend it to anyone who's interested uh about corporate or company turnaround strategies or anyone who's interested in business at all really you know it's a really really good tale about uh, one of the world's most famous brands and some some, some stories that uh, maybe most of you won't be privy to someone like myself you know i didn't actually know the detail behind what uh IBM's journey looked like, uh, especially uh, in that time and in that context. So I really enjoyed learning a little bit more about it. And if you watched my previous video uh, about uh, Microsoft's uh, CEO's book, that's this is kind of what I was saying was missing from that book, that level of detail and that uh, personality coming through uh, in the text. So from this one, I really got it a lot. I got, um, I got his perspective, you know, uh, what it was like wearing that hat, some of the things that he looked at, some of the things that he didn't see, and uh, what it really took for him to turn around IBM to happier days uh, by the time that he left. And I think it's a really, really good tale because, um, you know, it's almost a perfect story. You come in, company's about to crash, you turn it around and you leave right when the stock price is right there. And you kind of just say, hey guys, my work is done. Let me, let me go retire and play golf, you know? So I was really impressed by this. And one of those CEOs that um, will, for me, I'll put them up against the Jack Walshers of the world, which is someone I, I really, I really respect. RIP Jack Walsh. So yeah, really get this book not not a very not a easily accessible book uh haven't seen it at exclusive books or anything uh got this one and on take a lot so have a look out for it if you're interested in it interested in business and uh yeah or if you just want to learn about a really interesting tale cheers